Good morning to everybody. Um, we're here to uh, talk about the story of a face. And um, we're going to read to you. Yes, we're going to start by reading to you. A great, uh, some excerpts for, uh, from the extraordinary story by Joanna Connors, who, if you have not read this story, every photographer and writer and editor in this room should read it because it is one of the most exquisite science and human interest stories I've ever read. I think I'm supposed to start. But I think so you're supposed to start. I have to change my glasses. So. Sorry. I have about 12 pairs. <laughs> you know, when I had to start using glasses, I thought, oh, make them a fashion statement. OK, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. And speaking of which, take a look. Take a moment to look in a mirror. What do you see? Most of us would answer myself, my self. Our faces are the outer image we attach to our inner sense of self, to who we are and where we fit in the world. Faces root us in our culture, in the rituals and rules about how we present ourselves and how we see others. At the simplest level of identity, our faces function as our passport photo to the rest of the world. But they're also the way others seek to know us more deeply, to discover who we are behind that photo. Appearance is the most public part of self. It is our sacrament, the visible. The visible self that the world assumes to be a mirror of the invisible interior self. Look in the mirror again. Think about what you can do with that face you can kiss, <laughs> our favorite thing to do, right? You can kiss the ones you love. You can bite into an apple. You can sing and sigh. You can smell freshly cut grass. And you can gaze at your newborn and touch your cheek to theirs. Go back to the mirror one more time. Look at your incredible face. Imagine what it would mean to lose it. Maggie. So, yes. <laughs> We're going to ignore them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So how was it to begin this journey? How did it start? Well, of course, I went to meet this double field family. And I have to say they're an exceptional family. And Katie, especially, um, who I nicknamed Kitty Cat Katie, which of course she hated because she doesn't even like cats, but she puts up with it. <laughs> anyway, um, but I went with this idea that um, we are much more than this, you know? When we're growing up, especially I think with girls, um, our mothers always tell us, you know, real beauty comes from inside, mm. and this doesn't matter so much. Uh -huh. But of course, we're measured by this, yes. no matter what. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. But one of the things I was determined to do as the story moved on was I was determined always to make beautiful pictures of Katie, because Katie is a beautiful person. She's an exquisite spirit. And so quite often when I would go, we would always have a little portrait session, which was a lot of fun, because of course it took us out of the daily routine of therapy, you know, physical therapy, speech therapy, all of these things that are processed. And so I would um, always try to make a beautiful portrait of her because I wanted to pay respect and homage to her courage and her lion heart. But beyond beauty, the story has to do a lot of hard work. It does. I mean, every story in this magazine has to earn its space. And there were three or four things that the story addressed that are really critical issues today. Um, uh, most notably, this uh, rise in suicide because of uh, the impact of social um, media. Yeah. Among uh, teenagers. Especially among teenagers. Uh, the rate is up 25% in boys and, and an unbelievable 70% in girls. Terrible. Yeah. And they, uh, 
the project also had to illuminate the issue of the proliferation of guns, so the availability in a moment of passion, uh, an act that one couldn't take back. And of course, organ donation. Yes, and a young woman who um, donated, whose face was donated to Katie also uh, had seven other organs donated to people. So her life ended up saving eight lives. Yeah. And that's a remarkable thing. It is. We really hope people think about that sort of thing. When you, you know, renew your driver's license. Yes. Right. Oh, one thing that we neglected to say, and I think we might as well say it now, is that um, this story came to us, to the magazine, through our wonderful editor, Susan Goldberg, uh, because she has some uh, very uh, excellent ties and contacts yes. Yes, in Cleveland. And uh, the Cleveland Clinic uh, told her that they have the youngest face trans uh, plant recipient in the United mm -hmm. States history. And would she like to have it exclusively for the magazine? Mm -hmm. And of course, Susan being the very brilliant person that she is, and we love her for so many reasons, um, said, of course. And so we've had this story exclusively, which was quite a privileged mm -hmm. thing. And the family agreed to it as well. So I think that's always important to point out. Mm -hmm. but, um, and so uh, it's a science story. And I think that's uh, one of the things that that's, the story is so tough to tell. Because uh, combining science and uh, humanity is, is, uh, is quite a balancing act. Well, you know, this story does something really well about that because um, um, I think both of us are very interested in bringing science off the pedestal mm -hmm. and making it applicable mm -hmm. to human life and how it can, and to help people understand and I think accept it mm -hmm. more as well. And of course, I grew up with a scientist for a mother and so I always thought it was quite a magical thing anyway. Mm. But this story really shows how uh, science can impact people in the most personal way. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's really also important to mention that Katie will, in some ways, forever be a scientific experience. It's probably better to say she'll be contributing to moving this face transplant mm -hmm. science forward because she's the youngest one. And um, yeah. the... Um, she's the age of many of the many military of, personnel. Exactly. And, who, of course, funded this. Yes, the Department of Defense. And, A lot of and now so many mm -hmm. military people are coming back with disfigured faces. Mm -hmm. So Katie was uh, opened a door that hadn't been opened before because mm -hmm. She's the same age as a lot of these younger people who come back from war mm -hmm. with disfigurement. So, she's so to tell a science story, though, mm -hmm. you know, like we're just in the field. What happens when the work comes back? You need a team of people who are as compassionate and caring. And so we would like to say, we love you, Kurt, Kurt Mutchler. Mutchler. We love wherever you. Wherever you are. We love you. <laughs> yeah. Kurt Mutchler. You are. And for everyone who fought yes. for the power yes. uh, of these moments, uh, to keep them on the page, put them on the page, help them come alive again. Yes. And for Sa yeah. to Sarah Lean for having faith in us mm -hmm. and confidence in us. We really appreciate that so much. And um, yeah. So. So. Here we are, talking about science. Yeah. But you know, I think in this room, people probably just want to know, what was it like when you got that call? Oh, Lynn, OK. Good. Well, I was given this story. And I had been working on it for about two years, I think, more or less. And you know, and. All during that time, Katie um, was having surgery to prepare her little, uh, what I called a piecemeal face. She always called it her Shrek face, but I didn't think it looked anything like Shrek. And actually, it was this made-up face, but I, at some point, I fell in love with that face. Mm. 
and it's because of her great heart. But I loved that face, and it was kind of a challenge to photograph it. I, I wanted to make it so beautiful so that people would not recoil from it, but to see who she was. Mm. But um, so sure enough, here comes the possibility for a face to be donated, and where am I? In Dubai. Mm. And um, when a face becomes available, everything moves into action. And even though Audria, this young woman, uh, was being kept alive on, um, uh, what do you call it? Life support. Thank you, life support, <laughs> sorry. Um, anything can happen. She could yes. still have died. Mm -hmm. So people can't wait for a photographer to get on the plane and get back. So Kurt sent you, and I was so grateful because we are great friends. We're like sisters. I love you. I admire you. I, I, I you know, and I thought, okay, here's a very difficult moment for this family, and I felt like I was letting the family down. Mm. I was letting the magazine down. But I thought, okay, but it's going to be okay because it's Lynn. And Lynn, you're so, you're lighter than air. You're, you can be invisible, you know? You're just, you're just an amazing person, and yet you, you take those pictures that are like pow, you know? And of course, you were going in to photograph this dramatic moment and meet a family you had never met, yeah. and they yeah. were meeting you yeah. for the first time. And I, I, I think it was, uh, must have been very daunting. Well, I remember landing at the airport and um, calling you immediately. Uh, I, I wanted essentially your blessing. <laughs> I, I wanted to, that you to know that I would care for this family, for this story, for this passage, that I was just a kind of steward of this time. Well, you were more than a steward. Oh. And this actually, is, but, but, but this is how I think, this is what makes the difference, is when you feel that you are serving the story, it changes everything. Yes. And I just felt like that passing of the moment. And I think that it uh, allowed me to enter the operating room because I had never met the family. I, I was, you know, I had your words. I had your uh, compassionate view of who they are and what they've been through. And to enter the emergency room and then to witness this incredible moment where the life of Adria in the form of her face and her identity was passed to this neutral place, mm -hmm. this place of non-identity. And the face sat. It sat for a moment. And it was a kind of spiritual moment where everyone was just, I think, um, shocked by the reality of how an identity could be disconnected and reconnected. Mm -hmm. And so at this moment, it belonged to no one. Mm -hmm. And then passed to Katie in the next operating room. It was really fascinating, because it didn't look like Adria once it was taken off. Mm -hmm. And it, of course, didn't look like Katie. Mm -hmm. And it, is, it, it was its own entity, in a way, which is also so interesting because, of course, the title of the story is The Story of a Face. So in a way, the face is a real, this face on this table is a real character in this very long and ongoing saga of uh, Katie getting a new yeah. face, Katie. It's like the center face. of concentric circles where we're uh, looking at relationships, yes. the relationship of of, of Adria to Katie, forever connected. The relationship of Katie and the medical professionals, where they all clearly and were passionate about doing their very best. Yes. And to the family, and the family to you. And um, But you know, it's, to me. We, we like to talk about, or sometimes I think as photographers, we 
talk about something as our story, mm. you know, but it's not our story. It's, it's not never our story. our story. No. It's their story. Yes. And I even like to think that the pictures, at least for me, the pictures are not mine. They belong to the people in the pictures. And that's why I, I'm a photographer, I think, sometimes, is that I can take a picture and I don't have to claim it as my own. Mm -hmm. It's it's their picture, yeah. and I love that idea that they own that picture, they own that image, and um, this family was exemplary in mm -hmm. giving us such access. So, but I wonder if those are the things we tell ourselves mm -hmm. to make it okay. You know. You know, we are kind of magicians in some ways, bringing reality, squishing it to two dimensions, sharing it hopefully, with the world? Well, throughout the two and a half years that I was photographing, and I guess in the end we've been working on this story for three years, mm -hmm. more or less. And um, one of the things that, I mean, I would watch, and I'm sure you saw this too, but I would stand back and watch the stubble fields who just let me so deeply and intimately into their lives, which was quite a gift and quite an quite a trust, um, and I um, was marveled, I would marvel at these parents and how they mm. were warriors. Yes. They yeah. were warriors for their daughter. Yes. And educated. And, and educated. So they learned sophisticated everything. sophisticated in yes. the medicine. They, learned, yeah. they could be doctors now. Right. Uh, and they were, they were, they were determined to mm -hmm. get the best for their daughter. Mm -hmm. And they did, they were relentless in it, but in the most sweet and uh, professional way. And I think that it made a huge difference. And it made the doctors really embrace Katie. Mm. And be it became a very personal thing. And I, I also think, although it's a little bit of a sidestep, but we have to remember Sandra Bennington, who is the grandmother, mm. who, um, whose granddaughter, Audria, was in a coma from a drug overdose, absolutely was not going to come out of it. And Life Bank uh, approached uh, her and asked if she would consider donating mm. Audrey's face. Mm. And this woman uh, decided to do that. And we were also very lucky that when uh, Sandra and Katie first met. What was that like? Oh my goodness. What was well, that like? Katie was sitting on the couch by herself, and I know she was a little bit nervous. And uh, Sandra, we, it was at a friend's house, and Sandra walks in, and she's a sweet lady. She's a wonderful lady. And so she goes right over to the couch and says hello to Katie, and then she sits down and she says, Give me your hand. And then she put her hand up to Katie's mm. face, and she said, You look beautiful. And it was just one of those moments after which you could, there's just really no words to express what that was like and to get to be there and, and hear that woman uh, say that. And Katie was so sweet to her too. It was a magical moment. And, and that's what's so important about organ, organ donors, you know, that, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a great gift. Yes, and now Katie is back in life, engaged in life, uh, yes. experiencing um, new family members. Yes. And a new niece. Yes. Yeah. So, so. Um, you know, this, this idea of who owns the story is just mm -hmm. so interesting because I think sometimes. Uh, in our profession, ego is, um, it can be our fuel, but it can also poison a story. Mm -hmm. It can poison our efforts. And um, I really feel like we've heard many times in this building, on this stage, oh, I, I want to give someone voice. Uh, that's my job, I give people voice. Mm -hmm. But in fact, there's an enormous wall between uh, the image maker and the person who is being photographed. Mm -hmm. We use words like subject, 
-hmm. which is somewhat dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And so I think today, for the first time, perhaps, yes. on this stage. First time. There are some folks in the audience who are going to help us keep that very sacred promise to give voice. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we want to introduce you to the warrior family, the Stubblefields. Please give them a warm welcome. Everybody. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, well thank, thank you everybody and thank you, uh, thank you Lynn and Maggie for such, a, such an interesting and important discussion. My name is Susan Goldberg. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of National Geographic and the Editorial Director of National Geographic Partners. And I am so honored that we have the Stubblefield family with us today uh, to talk about you know, what, what do they think about this experience and this story? And of course, this is Katie and her mom, Elisa, and her dad, Rob Stubblefield. Um, <laughs> so Katie, I want to start by asking you, you heard Maggie and Lynn talk about, you know, essentially living with, with you guys, especially Maggie, for you know, two, two plus years. <laughs> what was it like having these photographers around all the time? <laughs> and you can tell the truth. <laughs> well, well, I think that Maggie uh, is a cool a cool picture of I love. One picture, one picture. Of everything. Um, then, Let's wait and let your mom catch up here for one second. I'm <laughs> sorry. Okay. So when she first came, met Maggie, she just thought, this is cool. She seems like a nice lady. Um, <laughs> she said, uh, I think you said a little bossy. <laughs> I better work on that. <laughs> we love Maggie. She's, we love Maggie. But um, she said, it's OK, Mom. We'll do this. We can help people. And, Take a few pictures, and you know, now that this has happened, I can't go backward. I have to go forward. So maybe this will help. So I think in her mind, if tell me if I'm wrong, you were saying you thought she was going to take a few pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think she said exactly. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> well, so. So Katie, so what did you, when you realized that maybe Maggie was going to take a few more than a few pictures, um, I mean, did you, did you feel ever that there was sort of a loss of privacy or were you happy that, you know, uh, other people were going to be able to be focused on this issue? Uh, how did you feel about that? No, I don't feel like that. Have my friends I look like everyone can see my face from my real time to everyone's face. I really, I actually, I don't feel that way. Um, the more, more pictures that were taken, um, because 
even more comfortable. I know that, that feels good a lot. But I'm, I, was, I was very comfortable with my boots. She said Maggie's really great. She's very comfortable with Maggie. At first, she said, you know, she got, was getting used to uh, the pictures, but she did not feel like her privacy was being invaded because after the injury, you know, when we were out in public after a year in the hospital, even though Katie's vision's not back, she would say things like, I feel people staring, I feel, and she knew that. Uh, and we would just be honest with her and say, you know, people don't know what happened. You know, we live in a world of, hey, what happened? But um, she did not feel, we did not feel one bit invaded. And Maggie was always so professional and she would say, you know, we can do this, we can't do that. And there were, there were times that Maggie had a plan, but because of Katie, where she was at in the journey of getting well, we, we would have to, Maggie would be totally, absolutely fine with it. So it was just, we couldn't have asked for a, a better, person who was so professional and yet understood the compassion part of it and understood the the pain that Katie was going through because you don't spend that much time with people and not get it. That's so true. Well, you know, actually <laughs> Well, Maggie, I did I did want to ask you because this was you know, a difficult story in a lot of ways, right? There's, you know, a young woman so brave but with a really difficult injury, um, and you got to know this family so well. I mean, I, I saw where you all were living for, you know, two and a half years at the, excuse me, four years, at the Ronald McDonald House in an area about the size of this stage. And then, <laughs> as if that weren't close quarters enough, in comes, you know, the <laughs> photographer from the National Geographic to, to, you know, spend a lot of time with you. So how was that for really, you know, all of you getting to almost be a family? Well, um, of course, there's always this initial getting to know each other. <laughs> and actually, when I first met Katie, she was in the hospital and she'd had this apparatus put into mm, her face where literally the doctors would come in and turn the screws. Uh, which was very painful. And Katie was quite often in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. Um, so little by little, uh, we got to know each other. And actually, very quickly, remember when Katie got out of the hospital and we went to the park? And, <laughs> so, and that was a beautiful day. It was the first sunny spring day. So they were lying and resting. And I thought, this is lovely. Thank goodness it's out of the hospital. But um, this family really embraced me and let me in. And they spoke very honestly uh, about Katie and about some of the issues that she had faced. And um, they were extraordinary in that way. And I got to go to the doctor with them. And so I learned a lot as well. And that helped me to know what I should be looking for and, and that sort of thing. But I think um, that this is, some of the people in the film at the beginning said this, but um, sometimes you just have to, and I heard Andrea Bruce say it yesterday, sometimes you just don't take pictures. You listen and you watch, and you learn that way, and you let people get used to you. I, I kind of didn't probably, well, you know, you just go in and you start taking pictures, but also, <laughs> I mean, but just a few, and um, <laughs> just a few. <laughs> but um, really, the family was. I just felt like they embraced me, and I became a member of the family, and they they were wonderful. Well, did you feel that way too, Rob? Uh, yeah, it was. It was a thing to where very quickly, if you had any apprehensions, they quickly disappeared. Uh, you know, Maggie's personality, which is kind of larger than life. Um, <laughs> I can say that. Um, but also a breath of fresh air. And, and also she, uh, she said some of the initial things she would say is, let's go to dinner. And she said, and you can have a glass of scotch. And I said, I like you. But, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's a thing to where, uh, as Katie has uh, attested to and Maggie 
that she became a fabric, a part of the fabric of our lives. It sounds like a commercial, doesn't it? But it, it's true. It really is. It's uh, uh, there were the defenses were down. She came in, and so every now and then, when the, she would, we would get the call, and she says, "I'm coming to town," you know, it's just like great. And then we pick up where we left off. But I think, from our vantage point, to you who do this all the time, is that when there is that relational aspect with that photojournalist. Yeah, I think it translates not just in their skill of taking a picture, but it translates into the reality that this is humanity. These are people. This is not the subject matter of a story. Yes, yes. And, and I think, I, I think that's one of the great things that allowed us to be very open because of the fact it was National Geographic. Its reputation preceded all that, and yet, we saw the, the human side of it because it, with Lynn when she came, Maggie and all those many times, uh, just becoming so integrated into who we were. And we didn't have to stage. We didn't have to have, have game on. Uh, and that's what, that's what brought everything. We just didn't have, there was no performance. Well, so then I'm, I'm kind of curious, what was it like when you learned that when the big moment came, right, it wasn't going to be Maggie who you'd gotten to know and were so comfortable with, but this other very lovely person, but somebody that you had never met before. Did that give you a moment of pause at all? No. No, I have a bad one now. She seems pretty cool. She seems pretty cool. <laughs> she seemed pretty cool. Well, that was true. <laughs> and, and I think Maggie called, and Maggie said, I highly recommend, you know, she, she said, she won't miss a beat. Our personalities are different, and which they are extremely. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Lynn came in, and she was just. There was such a when the when we got the call, you know, your your emotions are high and everything. But when she came in, there was just such a calm with Lynn, and she just quietly this and whisper this and, and and of course we no offense Lynn we wanted Maggie because we wanted what we were comfortable with and that's just who we are but when Lynn showed up it was just it was just it was though she had always been. Yeah. Well, so, you know, in addition to the Maggie seal of approval, Lynn, <laughs> you got, what was that like for you, though, parachuting in into the really the most intimate kind of situation? I know you've spent your career in those kinds of situations, but with this, with this family going through this at this moment and with this, you know, young woman going through something that most of us just can't imagine. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, it was a bit uh, daunting because I think uh, I felt the responsibility uh, on so many levels. And, um, and I would say, in addition to being able to witness the incredible transformation that was both surreal and um, kind of sacred in the uh, operating room. The, the high point for me was being able to leave that room and go find you wherever you happen to be camping, like in a hallway, in the room, in the, in the you know, lunch place, whatever, and to sort of give you a sense that, that there was progress, that everyone was being completely professional and giving, that they actually, that there was a moral center to the surgical team. And I thought that that, just being able to go out and talk to you and give you news was, um, felt like a, a deep responsibility as, as important as taking the photographs. So, um, and just actually seeing Katie who, you know, now I had been with you more when you were asleep than when you were awake <laughs> at that point. Um, to literally see the transformation, yeah. the physical transformation was quite astounding. Yeah. Well, Lynn, I think you, you had a picture that was in the magazine and, and possibly on the screen here of when Rob and Elisa and your son mm. see Katie for the first time mm -hmm. after the surgery and you all look so surprised, I think, you know, because, well, we talked about the face, right? And 
that's sort of your passport to the world. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you, Katie, about that exact thing. Um, I'm not sure how to put it, really, but does your face now feel like your face? You know what I mean? She said the face is becoming uh, more and more her face. Um, after the transplant, she would daily, many times a day, just take her hands and and this, you know, the the sensation wasn't there for. It's still coming, but you know that this first several months, uh, it was just her hand would touch the new skin, and you know nothing would move. Um, but more and more, she would uh, continue to touch her face, and there would be some blood flow, and it would be okay. This really is mine. And then she said, uh, up until when she got hurt in '14 till 2017, she said she almost got used to not having, you know, nose, lips, jaw, everything. But then when she had the transplant, it's just incredible and an amazing gift that she has right now. And just by daily, it's becoming your face. Well, and I know, Katie, you've said that one of the things that you'd like to do with sort of your new chance at life is to help other young people who feel like they're really up against a wall. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And I want to be able to help people in the way that others help me. Whether that's just me talking to someone about how, how precious life is and how beautiful life is. I will see people make their full things in life and I feel like I can I think it's not worth living, but it is always worth living. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I just want to encourage others and let them know how wonderful I am, and it is always worth living, and that there's always someone there to help me when I can. She said ever since she got hurt, she has had so many people have helped her to get to where she is, uh, doctors, therapists, just people that have come alongside of this journey that we didn't know and have just encouraged us that, you know, this is not the end, that you have to go from here. And um, it's been a very long journey, but 
uh, we've just had people placed in our life that we'll probably be friends with for a long time. But she was saying too that um, she knew before that life was precious, but even more so now, and she's getting a second chance, and that life is always worth living, and when you have problems, there's always someone to go to, someone to talk to, and it, life is beautiful. <laughs> are going to have to, to unfortunately get off the stage in just one second, but I just wanted to let you know how much of an impact your inspirational story has had, and I think like your mom said, it is just the beginning. You know, um, there's an organization called uh, Chartbeat, and every year they measure how long people read stories. How much time do they actually spend reading stories? And last year, they measured 60 million different stories from all over the world and how long people spent reading each of those stories. And Katie's story, the story about your amazing journey, was, was the 41st longest read story out of 60 million stories around the world, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> and out of all of the stories about science and medicine, it was the number one longest read story. Number one. <laughs> So I think on top of everything else you've done and what you're going to do in the future, uh, you should know how much your story has touched people all over the world and how um, much people care about what's going on with you and with your whole family. So thank you so much. We are so honored. Thank you. Thank you.